Hello. I adjust my screen there. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Camper English. Uh, welcome to tonight's chat panel discussion hosted by Beverage. I'll do some housekeeping and then we'll get to introducing our panelists. So um, tonight we're going to talk about water and whiskey. Uh, these talks are sponsored by Beverage, which, as you probably have seen by now, is producing some sample kits. The first one is on American single malts. And uh, I believe that comes out pretty soon and you'll be able to try that. So have a look on the website if you haven't already. Uh, these chats were meant to be interactive. So you can probably see, particularly if you're on the beverage site, I'm not sure, I think we're simultaneous, simulcasting to YouTube tonight. And if you're on YouTube, you might not see the same screen. But if you're on the beverage.co website, you'll see uh, both a Q&A tab as well as a chat tab. So the chat tab, have fun with it. Uh, you can talk to each other and um, uh, feel free to share whatever you feel like there. I might put some links there as we go along. The Q&A tab is for questions for the speakers. You can ask them whenever they come to mind or feel free to wait till later in the chat to see if we haven't covered it naturally already in the talk. And you can also upvote other people's questions so that they have priority uh, in case there are lots of questions uh, being asked. So uh, we encourage that interaction. Uh, these talks by Beverage are on so far all different aspects of whiskey. They've been on whiskey investing, whiskey social media influencers, how to taste, history, uh, we're talking about ice later, but tonight we're talking about a different form of water, the liquid form, and how that interacts with whiskey. So um, with no further ado, uh, we'll each introduce ourselves briefly, and then we're each going to talk a, at length about a particular topic and then get a lot more interactive after that. So to start, my name is Camper English. I'm a writer, journalist. I uh, give a lot of talks about geeky stuff related to cocktails and spirits. And a few years back, I got really nerdy about whiskey and uh, water and uh, did a lot of research on that. So we'll talk about that as we go through. My website is alkademics.com. Maybe I'll put that in the chat as uh, we introduce our next speaker or rather Alistair will introduce himself. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Camper. Uh, my name is Alistair Brogan. I um, am the owner and uh, general dog's body at uh, Boulder Spirits out in the beautiful state of Colorado in the town of Boulder. And we are a distillery that makes uh, American single malt whiskey as well as bourbons. And we do quite a lot of finishing, uh, sherry, port, peated. So, we do a whole wide range of uh, single malt whiskeys and uh, bourbons. Great, and uh, and you you have a couple whiskeys in the t uh, first tasting kit. Is that correct? Yeah, we've got two whiskeys in our in our uh, tasting kit. We've got an American single malt whiskey, uh, bottled and bond, and that's a whole new discussion. Uh, bottled and bond, and we've also got our peated single malt whiskey, uh, which is. Uh, uh, very light expression of peat within uh, the single malt. Great. Thank you and welcome. Uh, and next up, we have uh, Jennifer Kaliao. <laughs> close, really close. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's Jennifer, it's Kaliao. Uh, it's French by, uh, you know, being in the States for, for several, several generations. Um, anyways, uh, so I own a couple of businesses, one small hand foods. I've had that for coming up on 14 years now. Um, making, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. is the cat's name? <laughs> uh, that is Lord Rivers because I was a theater student and we all must name our pets after Shakespearean characters. So, um, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so uh, Small Hand Foods is a, is a syrup company. I make syrups for cocktails. And then during the pandemic, I started Small Hand Cocktails, so an RTD company. 
Um, I also work as a, uh, as a beverage director and consultant. Currently, I'm the beverage director for the Bon Vivants in San Francisco, which um, owns and operates um, Trick Dog and Shea Shea, which was Bon Voyage, but it's not Shea Shea. Um, and I also write, uh, lately, the biggest project has been for Beam Suntory's The Blend about cocktail families. So all around nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And can you tell us, uh, you've been at some other notable bars in, in San Francisco and, and the East Bay. And yeah. So I, a notable bar. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I came up at the Slanta door. Um, from there I went, um, I opened up a couple of different restaurants within that family. Um, uh, Heaven's Dog and Heart of Water. Um, I left there to, uh, be the beverage director and opening, um, um, kind of opening beverage person for the uh, for the the interval at Long Now, which was a kind of a, an intellectual um, bar run by a nonprofit organization in Fort Mason. Um, and then I left that to open my own bar in Oakland called Here's How. And we lasted about ten months before the pandemic hit, and I had to close it. Um, so yeah, now I'm just uh, working for other people, and to be honest, it's a bit of a relief. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I also, aside from my own businesses, of course. <laughs> oh, well, here's to that. <laughs> so so um, we're each going to give a little spiel, I suppose, about uh, an area of expertise related to water and, and, and whiskey, and then we'll be a little bit more interactive. And uh, I'm going to go first and sort of introduce how water is used in the production of whiskey generally. And then we'll hear from Alistair afterwards about specifically the types of water used to make uh, Boulder whiskey. So um, oftentimes, if you've been on a whiskey tour or a whiskey website or even a lot of other spirits, you'll find them um, really promoting the water source. Our water is pure Kentucky limestone water. If you visit Jack Daniels, they show you the cave with water running out say this is our limestone cave water uh, at uh, Glenmorangie in Scotland. It's the Tarlogi Springs. Uh, Alistair, could you pronounce Tarlogi better than I can? No, that was perfect. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to move to Scotland and like go native. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, you tend to see the water source as part of the distillery tour or you hear about it a lot. But uh, a bunch of years ago, I started on this water um quest because I was doing math for fun, which I think is how we all get into it. And I was doing the math on, uh, wait, if that water is coming from that cave, um, then we assume the bottle is 60% is uh, special magic cave water and 40% alcohol because it's, if it's bottled at 40%. However, um, as, as I'll discuss, it's not really the case. Uh, it's actually a small fraction of that water. So in the production of whiskey, first we make beer. So we ferment grains and you need water to do that. Uh, then after the whiskey is uh, fermented, it is distilled. And that is a process of separating alcohol and water. So we are removing a lot of water there. And then we put it into a barrel and into the bottle. So, and at each point there, we have some water addition. So in the first water edition for fermentation, uh, I think the beer people, uh, they've looked a lot closer at water than a lot of us uh, spirits people. They, they had a big head start, to be fair. Distillation didn't really show up for spirits until 1100 or so. But uh, the, the beer folks tend to put their breweries next to hard water sources, not just any water source, but uh, water sources with lots of minerals in them. And that's typically the special water that the distilleries are always talking about. It's got a lot of minerals in it. And why is that? Because the yeast actually can use the minerals in the water as a form of energy for in fermentation. And different distillers have told me that if you have water that doesn't have enough of those minerals in it, you're just not going to get a strong fermentation. So in, I believe in rum, sometimes they uh, add stuff to the water. They don't consider it fixing the water. They consider it uh, adding nutrients for the yeast and molasses, but um, to bring it up to higher mineral content in order to have that good fermentation. 
Whereas uh, in distillation, most people, we just start with a, a nice stream or some limestone water, et, et cetera, uh, that gives a strong fermentation. That is where the flavor is created for our eventual whiskey. And after that point, it's just concentrating and, and removing stuff for the most part. So after we've made our beer, we put it in the still, we separate out the alcohol and the water, say we distill it up to 70% alcohol or so. Now we've only have 30% water. We started with, let's say 10%, that would be a lot, but it's an easy number, um, 10% of, uh, of alcohol in our beer and 90% water. Now we're already down to 30% water. Uh, then we're going to take that 70% alcohol a new make spirit and put it into a barrel. Typically it goes in at less than its distillation strength. And um, then we let it age. Then to go from the barrel to the bottle, we water it down to bottling proof, which is done um, unless you are a, uh, a barrel strength whiskey, of course, then we're not adding water at that point. Now for the water we use for fermentation, that's that magic special stream water. But the water used to go into the barrel, it can be that water, or but it doesn't have to be that water. And different distilleries, I find, use radically different water. When I've asked questions to them, some say, oh, we just take the stream water and run a UV light over it to kill, kill um, any uh, nasties in the water that might grow in the barrel, even though it's unlikely because it's a lot of alcohol in the barrel. Um, or others say, no, we use uh, just tap water or distilled water at that point. And that same, usually reverse osmosis filtered or uh, distilled water, usually tap water, is what almost everybody, but as we'll learn shortly, not quite everybody, uses to water down their aged whiskey to bottle proof. The uh, their most folks are not adding any mineral content at that point. The distilled water has a TDS, is total dissolved solids, and you'll find that number on bottled water products. Uh, that's zero in the case of distilled or reverse osmosis water. And um, so it really, they're not trying to have an impact between the barrel whiskey and the bottle whiskey by choosing this incredibly H2O and nothing else uh, type of water. And uh, those are the three places that we add water to whiskey and it can be three different waters. And I think that's pretty interesting. When we do the math on it, I, I forget what it is for whiskey. So we get it up from 10% to 70% back down to, I don't know, 60% in the barrel to 40% in the bottle. Uh, we have something under 20% of that special water that we started with in our bottle despite what we might think based on all the marketing showing us the water, the special water. If we think about it for vodka, vodka is distilled up to 96% proof. Uh, so there's only 4% of that water to start with, and then it's diluted down back to 40%. So we have under 2% of that magic special water left in the bottle. And uh, that's pretty low. So when we think of uh, this water that we're promised is, is magic. There's not a lot of that actual water in the bottle. However, that water was used in fermentation to create flavor. So that's my, my, my spiel yeah. on where water is used in, in whiskey, um, pre-bottling. And uh, now we'll find out how it's used specifically uh, from Alistair at uh, Boulder Spirits. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, you summarized it pretty well there. And uh, the one thing that I find very difficult is that you know, there, in whiskey, there's grain, there's yeast, there's water. That's it. There isn't a great deal of differentiation in those three products. So the marketing people, once they get a hold of things, they have to spin a story. And, you know, very difficult, difficult to get the absolute truth from any whiskey distillery and what they actually do. So what you're told by one person might be different from another. But here at Boulder Spirits, um, I, just as a little bit of a background, I moved from Scotland with my American wife, my two Scottish-born boys, to my American wife, and moved across here when they were one in three, 10 years ago. And now I've got two proper little American boys now. Um, and I wanted to make the very best single malt whiskey 
American single malt whiskey I could. And even although there's only three ingredients, there are so many other factors that really blend into making a great, great whiskey, whether it be the barrels that are used, the water that's used, uh, the climate, um, the altitude. Uh, so there's so much that um, America, Boulder, and any other whiskey maker can, uh, can add to that whiskey. So here at Boulder, what we did was the first thing was to look at the water supply. And the water supply were the Rocky Mount, foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So all our water supply comes from one reservoir, Boulder Reservoir. And Boulder Reservoir, a little bit like Scotland, has got very, very soft water, very soft. And it's about down at about uh, 65 parts. So it's quite soft water. You want a soft water to give uh, a clean and sweet whiskey. So uh, when we analyzed the water and looked at the water, we were really looking at those um, outliers in any of the, the minerals that were in there. And because outliers, whether it's too little or it's too much, can have an impact on flavor and taste. You know, uh, salty, bitterness, uh, there's a lot of flavors, off flavors that can be created if certain of those minutes, certain, you know, calcium is too high or calcium is too low. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we're within those, those parameters. So when we got those within those parameters, we knew we had a good water source for exactly as you said, for uh, the mashing process, um, because that's the first and foremost. After the mashing process, we can make other decisions. So mashing, uh, uh, barrel proofing, and then bottle proofing. So in the mash, as you, you actually uh, mentioned, what we're looking for, and it's, this is a well-tested uh, um, uh, uh, process that the brewers have been doing for a long time. What we're looking for is maximum extraction of the sugars during the mash process. Uh, because sugars then, when you add to the yeast, then creates, during the fermentation, creates alcohol. And that's what we're wanting. So the only things we've really got to be careful of, now we've, we're within all those parameters, is really uh, the pH, uh, the acidic, alkaline makeup. And you're wanting to bring the, um, the pH down below that sort of neutral 7 to around about the 5.2, 5.4 mark. You want that because... Our grain, our malted barley, which is quite um, light, um, all, will also change that in the process. So you're wanting to lower it down. But again, exactly like the water chemicals, you don't want to go too low because you build a lactic acid up. Um, you, bring lactic acid, you bring lactic up and that can have off flavors. And if you go too high, again, you can have off flavors, but more importantly, you it starts um, uh, damaging the fermentation. So you're not going to get the yields that you want. So as far as our water source concerned, absolutely happy with that soft water that's coming out of uh, Boulder, Reservoir, uh, Boulder Reservoir. And we're at, we're at um, six, five and a half thousand feet here. So water even plays differently there. Mm -hmm. uh, our boiling point is not 112. Our boiling point of water is down at 102. That's why you can't get a decent hot, you know, hot cup of coffee in Colorado because <laughs> it takes about 15 minutes to boil instead of 10 minutes, and it's never hot. Um, so that's that's the water that we use primarily for the, the, the mash side of it. So and, and how do you how do you get that water? Does that come that come out of the out of the kitchen sink or um... absolutely? It literally comes out of the kitchen sink. And it's very easy. Uh, we fill it up. Uh, you know, if you go back to Scotland, there are distilleries in Scotland that are using municipal water because it's so good. Municipal water. Uh, yes, there might be um, uh, a little bit of chlorine in it. You put a little bit of chlorine when it goes through the, the processing from municipal water. But there's ways of getting rid of that chlorine. You know, you can, uh, you can either boil it off um, it evaporates off if you leave it in open air for, for, for long enough. Or you can put, um, uh, oh, what's it called? Camp, uh, 
Camden tablets in, oh, yeah. uh, which will get rid of that. Now, our parts per million, I think, was 15 parts per million, whereas the, the upper limit is 250. So we don't have, and I think they put chlorine in as a bit of a disinfectant, but also so pathogens can't build up in, in the pipes when it goes through. So that's the only thing we've really got to be I've got, we've got to be careful of the pH, um, making sure that the, the the chlorine is burnt off, uh, or or or, or we, we've got rid of most of it, and you know we've got to keep an eye on on the processes our Boulder Reservoir does because those processes change. Um, I wrote this down that chloramine is another substance that they're going to, they're starting to use. Which is a you need different techniques if you want to get rid of that, and uh, we're not there yet. So we'll meet that challenge when it comes. Yeah, that's what we have, I believe, in San Francisco. We have chloramine uh, mm. rather than rather than chlorine. Last last time I looked, well, a, a while ago, and so so clearly, I I mean, that, I'm guessing that the the chlorine isn't impacting the flavor uh, of the beer in distillation, then uh, we're, you're, we're, it's gonna be distilled out essentially, but it's not causing a problem with your fermentation. No, because it's, it's the, I, I, I know how much yield I should be getting from my one, every ton of grain. So there are certain techniques that I can't operate compared to this, uh, like other single malt whiskey distilleries because they're continuously, so like third waters are putting the methanol back into uh, the next distillation. We can't do that all the time. So our yield's slightly lower, but no, it's not having an impact uh, at all, at all. Okay, so that's uh, stage one for water. Stage one, and, and I just take a flip back and on that that you know that that soft water and what what, what we're wanting. And I always you know my, my son asked me when I was my, overheard me saying. You know what is soft water? My ten-year-old son. What is soft water and what's hard water? And I said, well, remember when you went to grand grandmother's in England and you tried to wash your hands? It didn't make any soap. It was very difficult. That's hard water. But in Scotland, when you wash your hands with soap, there's lots of lather and lots of soap comes out. And that's you know, it was the easiest way to explain it to to, to him. And I think that soft water is really really important. So that was the first step. Um, the second step, we talked, well, we talked about the, the, the mashing and what we're trying to do uh, with that. So the next step, and we're not adding any water here, but I want to talk about it a little bit because you, you alluded to it, alluded to it, is actually what is happening in the still with the water. So when you're distilling, and you mentioned, um, uh, was it, you're talking about 190, the vodka, 192, 193 proof. Well, you're right, uh, there's very little uh, water in that. And one of the rules for whiskies, almost all whiskies in, in the US, is it has to be distilled under 160 proof. 160 for ease is, because I find that a bit of an odd one, 80 alcohol by volume, which means you've got 20% of water, 20% of water. And it is that water that is going to capture all the flavors and tastes of the the sugars, the phenols, the lactoses, the esters, they're going to capture all those. So having high quality mash, high quality uh, um, beer, as it were, then put it into the still, you're wanting all those flavors and tastes to attach themselves to that, um, that water. And we probably, you know, we start on, on the first distillation, we go from eight and a half percent ABV to thirty percent ABV. Then we go up. Uh, we go up again uh, to about seventy ABV. But it's that long and slow process of distilling uh, that really allows those flavors of your whiskey uh, to cling to cling on. So even though we're not adding water, that process before is vital to the next process and then we use water for the condenser which cools uh cools as well and so you've got to get that right as, as, as well so that was the same stage the the next one is in the barrels and this is where it becomes interesting so what we do is we use exactly the same water that we've got in our mash to proof down our barrels 
But what we do with it is we put it through a carbon filter. So we've got really high end drinking water, really good drinking water, but we just do, uh, we don't neutral it out. We don't uh, reverse uh, osmosis. We don't, we don't demineralize it. Uh, we just put a carbon filter, filter in and that will take out uh, the chlorine. Because remember, the, the process before, you can't really boil it out or leave it in the air. So um, when we proof our barrels down, uh, we're using this exact same same water uh, when we proof it for barrel entry. So we're up at about uh, 70 ABV. So we're adding enough water to get it down to whatever barrel entry we are deciding to do, which is another another uh, whole side of it. So, you know, barrel entry normally is around about the 120 to 125 uh, proof mark. And then, uh, uh, and then we have one more water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we come out of the barrel and yeah. into the bottle. Uh, what water are we using then? Surely, the, now this must be reverse osmosis filtered <laughs> municipal water. Now, again, looking into you know what the and sorry, I I have never done the big mass tours in Kentucky, only in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So I, I think again, I think it's a bit of marketing, and you know. A lot of people have said, oh, you have to use uh, neutral water, demineralized water uh, for bottling. Uh, I'm not too sure everybody does. Uh, I read somewhere, I need to check my fact about this, but part of the rules in Scotland is when you're bottling, and if you're not bottling in your own distillery, then because most of the Scottish distilleries don't, don't bottle in their own distilleries, they send it all the way to Glasgow, Edinburgh to mass production facilities that bottle the water. So they can't bring their water with them. Uh, so they have a standard water, which is a demineralized uh, uh, water. And I, I read somewhere, and I, as I said, I need to check my facts that that is part of the rules for Scotch whiskey. If you're not bottling it in your own distillery, you, you, you've got to use uh, demineralized water. But I want to check my, my facts on that. So most of them will say we need demineralized water because that's really the only option they've got. So what we do is, at Boulder Spirits, we're a believer in, in using what we've got. And uh, we discovered a, a phenomenal uh, spring about six miles from here called El Dorado uh, Spring Water. And it's this artisanal uh, spring that has been there for hundreds of years. Uh, it falls down from the Continental Divide it goes between um, sandstone and clay. So you, can, you don't get any surface water penetrating into uh, the, 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 the water. And then it sits at about 76 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty warm and it's coming out naturally. They don't do any processing to it. And it's around about 65 parts per million. Uh, so it's... it's even less than uh, it's even lighter of a water. So we decided to use that and uh, it's worked very well. And in fairness, quite a lot of distilleries in Colorado use that water. In fact, it's so good. <laughs> There's the Berkeley water competition every year and it always comes uh, first or second is the best bottled water in the world. Um, you can take that as you, as you wish, depending on who enters the competition. But it all, it, it's a phenomenal water. People in Colorado uh, drink a lot of mineralized water. And one of the reasons they drink a lot of mineralized water, because of the altitude we're at, the electrolytes that it really uh, it is good for you. And we've got a lot of mineralized water up here. So I felt that we, we should use that water that we had. And we don't do anything to it. Absolutely uh, nothing. Um, so yeah, uh, those are the two waters we use. Uh, the first one, we do a couple of uh, uh, changes in them, whether it be the pH, whether it be the chlorine, uh, whether it be the, the carbon filters, and then we use El Dorado uh, spring water for uh, proofing into the bottle. Great, and the, and the El Dorado spring water, that's actually a, a bottled water brand uh, as well, right? Yeah. yeah. So you can, 
we can we could do a pairing um, of, of the, the water with the water in the whiskey. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've got some here right now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. OK, right, great. And now I know um, uh, we have a chance to maybe talk about uh, proofing down whiskey, but let's hold off on that for now. Um, and, and see if we uh, want to get to that level of geekery a little bit uh, later in the chat. Um, uh, so we can talk about drinking our whiskey um, after you've made it. Th th thanks for your part in the making it. And now it's Jennifer's part to mess with it. Um, she's a bartender. She has no respect for your work. <laughs> that's, that's fine. <laughs> so much respect. So much respect. You can't make a great drink out of shit product, you know? Um, I will just, I do want to point out though, that, uh, I think it's really funny about the companies that talk about, um, their spring water that they add to the mash, because like, think about, we talk about filtered water or reverse osmosis or distilled water. Guess what's happening through a still, the water that's in your mash is getting distilled. All the minerals that are in there to begin with are being, are left behind in the still. So you really are getting just that neutral water that is coming through the mash with the exception of like any sort of, uh, you know, small traces that are bonding with the, um, uh, with some of the oils in the grain. But I, I always thought that was really funny. So I think that's great. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to, uh, uh, to learn about um, the, the, the spring water that you're adding. That's super cool. Um, yeah. So let me see when I take a whiskey, I mean, like I, I love, I love water. I love sparkling water. I love mineral water. I love all kinds. I love them extra bubbly. I like them not very bubbly. Um, I'll drink it at room temperature, which, you know, I think a lot of people don't. Um, but, uh, I've become very used to it. Uh, and I've been making my own mineral water for years. Um, when I opened up, um, the inner bowl, I actually, re I really wanted to serve, um, like a sparkling mineral water that we would make all la minute. And so I ended up making like a mineral stock. And the problem was it takes time for the minerals to really like fully, fully dissolve into the water. So we just had, it was a, it's a very small bar. Um, and we had what a Crisali, which is like a little, um, you know, countertop carbonator that that's how we would uh, serve sparkling water or use soda water in our cocktails. And so my idea was, is, oh, I'm going to add, you know, a half ounce of this mineral stock to this bottle and fill it up with sparkling water that comes through a system. So it's all filtered and there's nothing in there. Um, uh, no other minerals in there. And then we would just serve it. But when we did that, it was, it was like looked milky. I was like, oh, I can't serve this, you know? Um, so when it came time for me to open up my own bar, I knew that I wanted to do this um, and serve it and like have sparkling water that we would serve in bottles. And I was able to do that by building out a good draft system and taking good filtered uh, water and adding the specific minerals that I wanted into it. Um, in the Bay Area here, people love Topo Chico. So I took the mineral content of Topo Chico and um, ended up making a Topo analog, but with a higher percentage of minerals per, um, you know, like per volume in there. So if I recall correctly, uh, the recipe I had was um, out of the mix of minerals, we would add 5.7 grams per 10 liters of water. And uh, we ended up adding 10, 10 grams per 10 liters of water. So almost twice the mineral content of Topo Chico. And we called it so, Super Topo. Um, and I, I mean, I, we, we would just drink it like it wasn't anything that we ever made money on, but I love drinking it. And all, any of my staff that love sparkling water, we would just drink the hell out of it. It was great. Um, but then I definitely knew, like I started making canned cocktails there. And this is, of course, before the big COVID uh, RTP explosion. Um, but I really wanted to do a Japanese style highball. Um, and I didn't want to make a special mineral water for that. I want to be like, okay, we make this mineral water. Let's make a highball with this. Um, and uh, looking more into Japanese whiskey, and as much as I love Japanese whiskey, uh, apparently the number one, um, uh, the country with the, the highest consumption of uh, Four Roses bourbon is Japan. So I was like, okay, so this is a Japanese style highball with four roses. And it turns out that the four roses um, tasted really good with the su super topo. We were really able to like um, kick up that, uh, that kind of like 
mineral, that hard water uh, aspect of it. Um, and it complemented the whiskey really well. So uh, for me, it was more about finding a whiskey that matched the water as opposed to uh, the right the right sparkling water to what to match the whiskey. But I think it's I think it's just such a fun and interesting thing to do. I've done other um, other kind of water blends. I did a, a, a consulting a consulting project for a gentleman in Oakland, and he drinks a an absolute ton of Pellegrino, and his name's Phil. So I did a super Pellegrino blend for him and called it Phil Pellegrino, and just stuff like that, like fun, you know, fun stuff. Um, uh, and I'm the one of the places I'm involved in now, um, Shea Shea we have a white wine spritzer on draft and the managing partner there, Drew, loves Grolsheiner. And I think Grolsheiner is awesome because it has such a high mineral con um, content. It's got nice, big, aggressive bubbles, at least at the beginning, um, sort of sidebar. Anything that has a really high mineral content has a real uh, hard time hanging on to carbonation. And it's because uh, the higher the mineral content, the more points of nucleation. So when you open up a bottle of Grolsheiner or a bottle of Topo Chico, it's super, super bubbly when you when you first um, open it up and when you first drink it. But by the time you get down to the bottle, bottom of that bottle, it's like it's not nearly as bubbly. Um, and it's really just because of that high mineral content. Um, and there's not there's nothing good about you. It's part of it, you know. Um, <laughs> So anyways, I have a, I have a little like Gerolsteiner, I call it like our mineral stock. And it's like this goopy, like white kind of oobleck thing. And we weigh that out and add it into our keg with our, uh, with our Lillet and our wine and all that kind of stuff and put and carbonate that. Um, Cause I think the, one of the most interesting things about using um, like a good sparkling water, a good mineral water in cocktails is that in cocktails, we typically balance uh, sugar and sour. We balance sour and sweet, right? If you're talking about an old fashioned where you're not adding citrus, um, you know, you're still just adding a little bit of sweetness and you're using, and you're trying to maybe um, balance that with like say bitter. But in general, most cocktails, it's like you're balancing the right level of sweetness for the right level of acidity. When you start adding in minerals, you're adding this third element of base or of alkalinity. Um, and that's really, cool and interesting. And as I experiment with this kind of stuff, I tend to add some and then add some more and then add enough until it's bad. And then I know I can start to pull back on that. Um, and you add too much and it can get fishy, it can get waxy and all that kind of stuff. But if you add just the right amount, it really just adds this complexity to your drink that really there is no other, um, I haven't seen really outside of the kind of highball realm um, or mineral, you know, anywhere in cocktails where you would use a mineral water where those minerals actually make a difference. And I just find that really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was only about uh, 10 years ago that I first heard of a bartender using salt in their simple syrup um, or fruit flavored syrups. And I was like, what is this molecular magic happening? And now we've gone all the way from there to what you're doing. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I wanted to ask, and I'll, I'll post links in, in the chat while you tell us, um, where does one find all of this information? Clear, you don't have a, a lab behind the, the, the door. The cat's not your lab assistant, is it? Uh, um, <laughs> Um, I do have a lab. It's not in my house. Um, <laughs> like, where do you find the information? I mean, yes, about uh, mineral yeah. waters and perhaps making your own. This is uh, one of, this is a good book. This is the book of waters. And you have, a, Camper, don't you have a different book of waters? I do have a different book of waters. Yeah, there's a couple, there's a couple of them. There's fine <laughs> waters. There's like a bunch of books out here. You know, I, when I see this stuff, I, I pull it out. Um, there's also, this is, and Camper, this is obviously, you see me tell this book for a long, a lot. This is the standard manual of soda and other beverages. And I'm not going to read the rest of it, but yeah. Okay, fine. Look, a treatise especially adapted to the requirements of druggists and confectioners. This is one of my favorite books. And this is, the recipes from this book are what um, Darcy O'Neill uses in his book, Fix the Pumps, which Camper is holding up right now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's awesome. It has a whole, uh, there's a there's a bunch of stuff here that was for soda fountains kind of before and during American Prohibition. So all kinds of stuff about different, um, different waters. And 
back then they made a distinction between natural waters and artificial waters. And really what they mean is just um, waters that, that we are adding minerals to, they, they call artificial waters as opposed to like pulling water from a natural spring that has those, those minerals already in there. Um, but back before people really understood the science about all of this, um, uh, mineral waters were seen as like uh, cures, you know, like, so you take this water for certain aches and pains and all this kind of stuff. So there's a huge um, focus on uh, different mineral waters. Uh, and then once we got booze back again, then it was like, hey, let's mix these together. Um, so uh, yeah, there's also um, a website. Um, what is it, Kymos? It's Kymos. I put a, a few links into the uh, chat yeah. and um, where a lot of us, I think, first learned, Kymos actually has like a calculator to. It does. If you yes. want Fourier, you do X, Y, Z. Yeah. So it tells you there's a couple. I mean, it's an incredible database. Um, it has, uh, I think, probably 60 different commercial mineral waters, and it gives you the the total dissolved solids um, of different minerals. Um, that's what I use when I'm making when I'm making these different water blends. Um, but there. The yeah, one of the cute things about about that is if you know the mineral um, content of your tap water, you can put that in there, and then it'll spit out a recipe that takes that into account, which is really cool. Um, so I like I like using that to make these um, these uh, you know commercial bottled water analogs, and then just taking them and you know fortifying them and adding different stuff or changing around the proportions. Um, but yeah, that's how I that's. That's how I uh, started learning about it, I think. Mm. Actually, Jennifer, to your point earlier on, you were saying about the distillation process, taking all that out. And you're absolutely spot on because the, 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 the mash is, a, is partly about yield and a partly, again, those sugars, those starches to change the sugars. Right. And the Scots especially are obsessive about yield, squeezing the last everything <laughs> out of everything. And... Um, <laughs> Well, my wife keeps on telling me, but yeah, everything. So, you know, it's yield, 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 and that's what it's about. So when you then distill it, uh, everything comes out of it anyway. Uh, mm. So you're absolutely right. I think, yes, for yield, the first step in the mash, and not too much wayward flavors that are going to go in to have too much of anything or too little mm. of anything. But then most important is into the barrel. But what we discovered, and it blew us away a little bit, was we did tests uh, coming out of the barrel and then proofing down and looking at um, uh, demineralized water versus El Dorado water. And we were quite blown away. And when I say that, there was quite a lot of us doing all blind tasting. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, difficult to actually put the finger on why we liked it better but our brain was telling us that's better. And right. that's when we flipped over, did those experiments, flipped over to the El Dorado water. And there's also something to be said, as I said earlier, you know, I've seen, uh, I say, casual research on, you know, the waters from Bayside, from Iowa, uh, from Highlands, and putting those waters in each other's whiskey or putting them in their own whiskey. So a Speyside water uh, with a Speyside whiskey and then trying an Isla whis whiskey in a Speyside, sorry, an Isla water into a Speyside whiskey. And again, it all comes around to, you no, know, it just it just feels better that a Speyside whiskey has got a Speyside water <laughs> and that Isla water has got an Isla water. Yeah. So subconsciously i think we we move to that and what we enjoy in the regionalization if you've got good water if you've got bad water you go elsewhere so right. that's why you don't get any distilleries in nevada or southern california because the water isn't that great and i've insulted a few people when i say that but i've been told nevada they literally bring the water in for the, even the breweries some some of the time because the water's not good right it uh, certainly makes sense. And, and I've actually, I have tried uh, the regional waters of Scotland. There is a brand, uh, unfortunately not available in the United States yet, as far as I know, called Whiskey Source. And they bottle water at, uh, from Island and Speyside. And 
the Highlands. And the idea is that you could pair it with the whiskey. And in my earliest uh, explorations, I went in as a total non-believer. And I was like, this is not going to have any difference at all. Like, and I'm too cool for this water. Well, I was not too cool, turns <laughs> out. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I tried the different waters with, uh, with one whiskey to see what aspects of that whiskey were pulled out. And what my conclusion was the regional waters seemed to emphasize the, uh, the regional flavor aspects that we associate with whiskey. So um, the Isla whiskey, the, the Isla water actually seemed to amplify the smoke impact for me right. and um, with a uh, maltiness or fruitiness or uh, floralness in uh, the other waters. No matter right. what whiskey was, it pulled, it sort of pulled it in one direction, it seemed. Yeah. And so that was cool. I, I became a believer in the in the power of water at that point. And, and I don't necessarily think that uh, we need to always marry the regional water with the, the sure. regional whiskey. That's the concept of bourbon and branch uh, here in the U.S. that you drink um, your whiskey with the branch of the creek um, or crick, as they called it where I grew up, um, the branch of the crick of where the water comes from uh, to make that whiskey. But uh, it's fun to certainly it's fun to try uh, different waters with different whiskeys, which actually I think can be a, a segue into talking about trying different waters with different whiskeys, not just the still waters, which I used in Scotland, but um, with highball waters like uh, Jennifer used uh, at the bar, you said you ended up uh, looking looking for the, the whiskey that matched the water. Yeah. Uh, I, I did uh, a bit of the opposite. I went to this store on the way uh, home and Got a bottle of Gerald Steiner and that and uh, Jennifer, you told me earlier, Badois has both of those have a lot of minerals in them. I love Badois. It's my favorite, but it's like it's to me, it's the upper end of, of the amount of minerals you want in the water. You know, it's like almost beers on soapy, but it's not. It's not. It's delicious. I love it. <laughs> it's like so salty. it's like it's quite salty. I think. Mm. So this I have a Gerald Steiner here. And, uh, and Alistair told us the total dissolved solids in his uh, El Dorado water was a 65, I think you said. This is yes. 2,500 in, yes. in this um, uh, sparkling water. So it's really different water. It's also a lot of that is bicarbonate, which is helping uh, it be carbonated, I think. But um, uh, it makes sense that it would have a, a flavor impact on it. So I tried, I uh, found a bottle of American single malt, uh, unfortunately not Boulder Spirits. I didn't have that handy. Sorry, Alistair, I didn't help with depletions this month. But, <laughs> um, uh, if you all go out and buy one of the beverage tasting kits, then uh, we'll, we'll sell more. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, and I've tried that with, uh, with Gerald Steiner, with Perrier, which I feel like is 400 something, um, total dissolved solids. And then just my tap water uh, run through the Brita filter um, and carbonated in a soda stream. And uh, the whiskey does taste quite different mm -hmm. in all three of those. I'm not sure that um, I have a, a fa my favorite might be Perrier for this one. It Maybe it's just saltier. I feel like it's get a lot more flavor, but it's also a little bit kind of sharp as opposed to with the Gerald Steiner, you have all of that um, all of that siltiness, uh, there's a little bit of a, a soft landing <laughs> as opposed to with the Perrier. It's like a, a, a springy, sharp sensation in the water. And then my tap water, I'm surprised. Usually I like it in high balls, but, but not tonight. It's feeling kind of almost bringing out a bitterness that I didn't taste in the whiskey. Um, and uh, Alistair, did you try some experiments with, with your whiskey today? Yeah, just a couple. I mean, I... I didn't go to such a high-end shop. I could hardly get anything. So I had the <laughs> Pellegrino and the um, El Dorado water. So the Pellegrino, I think, is about 350. I can't – it doesn't actually say in the bottle. I had to Google it. Uh, mm. But even between those two, although I'm used to El Dorado water, there there was – there were subtleties in that. And I actually – and I, I didn't think I was going to say this, but I actually quite like the subtleties in the higher mineral content. I didn't get that uh, because you, your mineral water was a lot higher than this. But I got subtleties, which I actually qu I quite enjoyed. It didn't take over the whiskey. It complemented the whiskey. But 
I still think I'll always go back to something with a, a lower mineral content, but not something that's got no minerals. I, I like the playfulness of, of, of minerals in. I only put, for most of my whiskies, I, I put so, so little. And in some of the whiskies, I put no drops of water at all because that's the sweet spot, as it were. Uh, some whiskies demand three, four drops. Other whiskies, nothing. So it really depends on what whiskey I'm, uh, I'm drinking at the time. And it's also what mood I'm in at the time. <laughs> so, uh, I feel the same when I'm, I'm drinking a whiskey, whether I'm having it on ice or in a highball. Uh, it's depending on the mood or, or neat, of course, which yes. is a lot of the time. And um, uh, we're, we're coming close to the end of our time already. I don't know how this happened, um, but, um, but speed rounds, um, uh, Jennifer, how do you like, do you drink uh, highballs a lot? How do you, how do you like to drink whiskey, uh, with water? Um, I do like highballs a lot. Um, so I, uh, I have probably too many silicone ice molds at my house in lots of different shapes. So um, I, I have a you know regular Brita filter that I filter all of my tap water through that I make my ice with. And I like to use, it's like a Tovalo kind of long spear because when I'm doing something that has, when I'm making a drink that has a high water content, whether that's a high ball or kind of any anything else that has like a lot of soda water or something, I want ice that has kind of the least amount of surface area that I can because I don't want um, I don't want the melted ice to take the place of dilution in the drink that I would rather have filled with the carbonated water, water as opposed to melted ice, which is uncarbonated, right? So I definitely like a good spear. Um, and I also have a soda stream here. So honestly, I will often use that unless I have a, um, uh, like a little batch of, um, of dry super topo or one of my like sludges or something like that. And I'll put a drop in. I typically don't buy mineral water for my house. Um, my refrigerator is full of uh, vermouth and syrup. So I don't have room for this kind of stuff in my house. Um, uh, so I won't necessarily buy like a, a buy a, 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 you know, like a, a brand of a bottle of sparkling mineral water that I keep at my house, but I definitely drink it when I'm out. And for me, just having it have it, it's having it cold. You want it to be cold. Um, uh, it's the, it's this law of, um, it's like a, there's a certain law of thermodynamics or basically the colder a liquid is, the, the more it can hold on to a gas um, and keep the gas dissolved in it. And that's why uh, also if a room temperature sparkling water, you open it up, it'll go, it'll go, it'll like be super, super foamy, foamy, but then the, the carbonation dies really fast. So I want my carbonated water cold and I want to open a fresh bottle and I want a big thing of ice so that that's not melting as much. Um, because really I want the greatest sensation to be the, 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 the bubbles in the sparkling water and then the temperature. And then I want to be able, I want to be able to taste that whiskey. You know, I don't want it to be like when it starts to get watery and not carbonated, I, it's a little sad, you know? I want, it to, I want it to be like lively and, and dancing on my tongue. Cool, yeah, I, I'd love to be fussy with uh, yeah. simple, simple ingredients, uh, ice and- that's, uh, my whole, that's my whole gig, that's my whole gig. All my syrups have like four ingredients, it's just handled very specifically, you know? And uh, uh, it's fun to get nerdy with water because relatively to whiskey, it's inexpensive. Um, what I do sometimes uh, for my little treat myself moment, I'll pick up at the Whole Foods or whatever, just waters that I haven't tried before and throw a couple in my bag. And I've, I've spent less than $10 on a Sunday fun day um, <laughs> a water sampling. And maybe I'll try that with whiskey to see what happens um, sure. afterward. And I think that in general, that's something that, that we've all been saying here is uh, to play with your water and your whiskey, whether you're having it uh, still water and having just a, a few drops neat, uh, as Alistair does, or making a, a, an obsessive highball, as Jennifer does, or whatever mm -hmm. I'm doing um, at the moment, math for fun. Um, it's a... Uh, it's a uh, it's really fun way to get something more out of the experience of uh, enjoying whiskey is to change up the water, to learn how the water is used in the process and then 
to um, to mess with it, and <laughs> see what happens. Um, and so on that note, we uh, are getting towards our end time. So I'll um, I'll do a, a wrap it up uh, info. Um, so uh, first, I uh, wanted to mention, as we have before, beverage is behind these American single malt uh, whiskey tasting kit is the first one coming out. You'll be able to taste Alistair's uh, whiskey, two different kinds, and perhaps see how they taste with water. So I'd like to thank both Jennifer and Alistair for uh, coming on this panel and joining. We got super geeky, and I can't believe how fast it went. <laughs> um, oh. And uh, welcome to everyone to, to check out uh, beverage.co for more information on the tasting kit and for future panel discussions. There have been some really fun topics. And next week's topic is on whiskey grains. Speaking of geeky, um, grains are the foundation of every single whiskey we drink. Malted barley, yellow and white corn, rye, wheat, rice, and so many more are what help us build spirits that become whiskey. But it goes so much deeper than just an exchange of sugars into alcohol. And that's what we're going to dive into in this panel discussion. Dr. Stephen Jones of Washington State University and Matt Hoffman of Westland Distillery will join Uproxx drink editor Zach Johnson as they dive into how we can coax flavors from a seemingly inert seed or grain. So that sounds uh, pretty fascinating to me. Uh, and uh, that's same time uh, next week, same place that you're watching this right now. And uh, there are plenty more talks down the road, including one on ice, a different form of water, uh, that I hope you'll be able to tune in for. So I'd like to, uh, thanks to my, my co-panelists and uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in to watch the discussion and hope to see you uh, 